Hey, I want you to turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 7. In Romans chapter 7, we have the introduction of the cross into our lives. We have the solution to the condition of our nation. We have the solution to the condition of every individual. And walking into our lives, into this moment right now, is going to be an introduction of the cross. I want you to think about your life before the cross, and I want you to think about your life after the cross. I want you to think about the disciples before the cross and the disciples after the cross. Because you see, the cross is the center of humankind from Genesis to our time. It is the crux of human history. I want you to think of it this way. The cross is at the center of humankind. Listen, all of history looked forward to the cross. All of the future looked back at the cross. All of hell looks up at the cross. And all of heaven looks down on the cross. Because the cross is the center of humankind. Think about that. Everything changes at the cross. And you'll see it in our text in Romans 7. As Paul is talking about this battle that is going on between the flesh and the spirit. Between what is wrong and what is right. You'll see as I read this. I'm going to read uh, verse 15 through 25. So follow along. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, I do not practice. But what I hate to do, that I keep doing. How many could just be like, uh, mic drop, set the Bible down, let's just come and talk about that. Let's just come down here and let's, I got to kill myself right now. I need to come to the cross, right? Because that's how we all feel, don't we? The thing that I want to do, I don't do it. It's the thing that I don't want to do that I keep doing. Man, what a, what a paradox. Keep reading because Paul's not done. But now it is no longer I who do it, but it is the sin that dwells in me. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I keep practicing. Now if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin that dwells in me. And he goes on and he says, I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind. Do you see that? What he's saying is it's a battle. I know what I should be doing, but there's this war going on inside that's telling me not to do that. Hear me. You have to win the war. It's, a, it's made up of a bunch of battles, a bunch of small battles along the way. But if you can win those battles, sometimes hourly, sometimes daily, if you can win those little battles, then you can win the war. And this is what he's saying here. Now, how do we do that? It's simple. You can't do it on your own. Paul says, the thing I will to do, I don't do. So listen, it's not about just, you know, trying harder. No. No, overcoming that temptation is not about trying harder. It's not like, okay, all right, I'm going to think, all right, right? Uh, I'm not going to do, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm not, right? And then the temptation comes, we go right back to it. No, it, it takes the cross. It takes daily death on the cross. Take up your cross Daily, uh, right? Let me, let me read that scripture in Luke 9. Jesus said, then he said to them, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself, take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for my sake, what good is it to forfeit your own soul? Now think about that. Listen, the answer to your battle is daily death. Listen, you can't kill a dead teenager. <laughs> you can't kill, you can't tempt a dead teenager. And if we could simply daily die to our flesh, 
then we win that, that battle every single day that ultimately helps us win the war. How? Paul gives us the answer. All right? Paul gives us the answer. It's not our will. Listen. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from doing these wrong things? Then he says, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Verse 25, I thank God that through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we have the victory. Okay, so... What does that mean? It means the work of the cross becomes our daily, where every day the work of the cross becomes our daily death. Okay? Now, the illustration that Paul gives is a symbol. Think about this symbol. Paul says, who will deliver me from this body of death? Who will deliver me from this body of death? You know, the Romans were considered, um, their punishment and the way that the the Romans set up uh, uh, like risk and reward, uh, crime and punishment. When you look at uh, sowing and reap, listen, you can, the, the English had their thing, the Spaniards had, uh, they were, they were kind of known for, uh, you know, punishment. The the Romans took punishment to another level. Obviously, we've, you've heard of the crucifixion and the incredible uh, process that someone would go through in even preparation uh, through crucifixion. And then there are other things uh, that were punishable uh, when law was broken, where uh, the Romans would actually, whoever had killed their Parents, the Romans would actually take them and put them in a carcass, sew them up with other, anim- other animals in this carcass, and throw them out to sea. The, the Romans had this way of punishing people. One of them, uh, Virgil, one of the great poets, were respected poets, wrote in the Aeneid, in the Aeneid, in his poetry, uh, Virgil talks about this body of death that Paul is alluding to. Paul was a world traveler. And I know that some people say that uh, when you use this illustration, it's not proper or whatever. I believe that history has proven, the, the, uh, the writers have proven it, and I think Paul's alluding to this. And I think it makes total sense as I share this, you'll see. See, what Paul was alluding to in this body of death was a Roman practice that when a person killed another person, the uh, Romans would take the, that dead body and they would place it on the back of the person that killed them. And they would tie them hand to hand and waist to waist and feet to feet. And that murderer would carry the person that they murdered. They would carry the, that body on, the, on their backs as punishment. Everywhere they would go, that putrid smell would be there. And the bloating carcass, right? Can, can you even begin to wrap your mind around something like that? How many of you would choose prison over that? And think about that, that disease and that filth and that reminder. Listen, that reminder of that act that you did. Isn't it interesting that Paul, one of, one of, one of the uh, reoccurring themes that Paul talks about is always putting my past behind me. Isn't that an interesting thought? I'm putting my past behind me. Think about that. This past death behind me, this body of death. And Paul talked so much in, in his writings about whatever is behind, I put in my past, right? This is, it's a powerful theme in Paul's writings. And I think that what has to happen is we have to apply the power of the cross to our past. Because hear me, the cross is a plus for all of us. The cross is a plus for all of us. 
And so what Paul is saying is, if you're struggling with this temptation and doing what is wrong when you know you shouldn't, bring it to the cross and let's kill it. Daily, as Christ said, let's kill it every single day. Now this is a one-point message. This is a one-point message. And what I want to do is to give you this one-point message, and then I'm going to tell you, uh, I'm going to give you some practical things to to do with this, and then we're going to pray. The one-point message is is simple. In Romans 7, he brings this last, this whole thing to a halt when he says, I find then a law that evil is present with me, okay, With, with me, the one that wills to do good. But this law in my members is warring against me. Here's the simple point. Most of us, in all of our problems and everything that we see and all of our temptations, most of us see a loss. And we don't see the gain. The plus. Most of us see the loss when we fail, when we break the commandments, when we disobey God's God's uh, intention, God's word. Most of us see the loss in that, and we bury ourselves under condemnation rather than, uh, rather than taking ourselves through conviction. Conviction and con- condemnation are two different things, right? But most of us, will, teenagers, will bury themselves under condemnation and guilt and pain, and we see the loss and not the cross. We see the loss and not the plus. We see the loss and not the gain. And what has to happen is we have to train ourselves to come back to war. We have to train ourselves on a daily basis to die to those things. I like to say it this way. I think the more that you die to a, let's say a sexual sin, that, you, that your generation is struggling with. The sexual revolution is, is alive. It, it has transformed American culture, and especially teenage pop culture. The sexual revolution is changing, every, it's changing the narrative. And if you can overcome that, I believe it is your, I believe it is a teenager's greatest win to overcome sexual temptation, sexual impurity, and gender issues, and all, all, of the, all of the stuff that comes with that. I, I, hear me. A teenager's greatest win is only going to happen when you understand this war that is going on, and you win that battle daily. I believe that if you can win hourly and daily battles, that over the course of just a few weeks, if you can focus your attention on that fornication, if you can focus your attention on uh, your sexual sin, okay, you name it, pornography. Look at your sexual sin. If you can focus your attention on that and die daily for just, listen, for just a few weeks, some say 20 days, do repeat 20 days, repeat a task 20 days and it becomes a habit. If you could take 20 days, just three weeks, and focus your, your prayer, focus your reading, focus your accountability, f- focus, get a mentor in your life on one thing, and you conquer that, it will become a strength to you and not a weakness. You see, I, I, I'm, I'm not tempted in the same things you are, and you're not tempted in the same things that I am. I've overcome some of the things that you need to overcome yet. Because I have daily fought that battle and gone to the cross, and now it is a strength and not a weakness. And it's almost as if we are reminding the devil, listen, that we are reminding the devil that every time he brings to us a temptation, we're going to bring to him truth. Okay? Every time he brings to us a temptation, we're going to bring to him truth. I want to read to you this text in Colossians chapter 2. It is the entrance of the cross into our lives. And as as Paul is talking about Romans 7 and then um, Colossians chapter 2, you're going to see the tie-in. You're going to see see these two come together. 
It's, it's really powerful. Because Paul says this war that's going on, right? L- look at this war that's going on. It can be won. Colossians 2 and verse 13. And you who are dead in your trespasses of, of, of your flesh, he has made you alive together with Christ. Okay? Remember, who will deliver me from this body of death? Christ. Thank God that he will, he will win the battle, help me win the battle of my flesh. And so he says, and you, dead in your flesh, in your trespasses, he has made you alive with him, having forgiven you all your trespasses, having wiped out the handwritten uh, requirements that were against you, right, which is contrary to you. What he's saying is this. What Jesus did at the cross was take all of the, all of the enemies, uh, listen, all of the enemies' uh, words against you. He writes those down and says, you are a thief. You are a liar. You are uh, a traitor. You are a deceiver, right? Y- you are, y- you fill it out. How do you feel? What, do you, what is the guilt you're struggling with? You're an adulterer. You are a fornicator. You could write these down right now. I am, right? This is what the enemy says. I am. You are. You are defined by your past. No, 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 no. You're not defined by your past. Listen, you are a piece of art. The artist just isn't finished yet. And so he says this, listen, he has nailed that list of things written against you. Colossians 2, 13 to 15. He has nailed that list of things written against you. He has nailed it to the cross, having forgiven you of that. And he has disarmed principalities and powers and made a public display of them, triumphing over them through the cross. Think about this one simple point. Most of us see this failure, and every time we sin, we see it as a loss when we need to start seeing it as the cross, as a plus, as a gain. Listen, if you could win the daily battle, you can win this larger war. I want you to think about it this way. Uh, I love this illustration. A friend of mine, his name is Eric Samuel Tim. Uh, Eric Samuel Tim is a painter, communicator, author. And one of the things that he does is paint and preach at the same time. And when I I, I saw him for the first time, I don't know, 15 years ago, okay? Long time ago, and I'd heard of him and So I show up at this thing where he is speaking, this convention, and I'm there, and I'm watching, I'm watching Eric, and he's, and Eric is painting this incredible painting on this canvas behind him, right? And he gets to work, the brushes, right? And uh, this, as this unfolds, I'm thinking, I'm in the front row, and I'm thinking, uh... This is not very good. I thought this guy was good. Right? And he gets back to work. Right? And I'm thinking, hold it. What is going on, man? Is this guy, is he he off today? This guy is (laughs) overhyped. And I know everyone in the room is thinking the same thing. What is this on this canvas? And as I'm watching him, I don't know, five to seven minutes he's painting He addresses the crowd. He says, you know, God God can transform your life. And he takes things that are a mess. And he, right? And Eric turns from the crowd and he goes back to the canvas and he does something. And he takes that canvas that he'd been working on for the last few minutes and he turns it upside right. And all of us can see now what he'd been doing. He had been painting upside down. I couldn't make any me- I couldn't make anything out of this mess. 
And all of a sudden, in one move, as Eric turns this canvas upside right, right before our eyes, we can see the whole thing. We can literally see now what he has been doing. He's been painting our lives. Because sometimes when we look at what's going on in our, on the canvas of my own life, it doesn't make sense. This mess doesn't make sense. This trash doesn't make sense. Everything that, everything that is defined or everything that is about my life doesn't make sense. Until you see the end. Until you see that God takes our trash and turns it into a treasure. That God takes our mess and turns it into a message. See, most of you have not allowed the artist to complete his work. You're only seeing half. You're only seeing from your perspective. You're only seeing from this limited view. But if you could see that God is not done with you, then finally, when he's complete with his operation, with his work, it will make sense. It's kind of like God's, God's uh, magnum opus. Do you know what a magnum opus is? The magnum opus is the greatest work of the artist. It is the greatest work of the composer. It is the greatest work of the poet. It is a master artist's finest work. And what happens is that magnum opus takes time. You know, as a writer, I'm, I'm a writer. As, as a musician, I'm a musician. As a communicator, I'm a communicator. In each of those acts, it takes hours, it takes work behind the scenes to finally come up with something that you really like, that you are, it, okay, that's well, that's well said. Because there are a lot of things that don't make sense at the beginning, but in the end, it makes sense. It's the magnum opus. And God is the artist, and we are his piece of work. Yeah, look at the person next to you and say, you are a piece of work. H hear me. This idea of trash art is really, really simple. God takes the things that we throw out and he makes something beautiful out of it. God takes our life before the cross, places us in that death moment, in that death pattern, okay? Okay that daily death pattern, and what comes out on the other side is something beautiful. But see, most of us, we never get to the cross. We never get to that point. But if we can get to the point of the death pattern, that daily death, then what comes out on the other side is beautiful. Uh, trash art. If you were to go to Instagram and you'd see the hashtag trash art. The idea behind this entire message is for us to populate and take over hashtag trash art and to fill that thread with our stories and with our victories. You can see it. I've been doing it for years. You see these pictures of people that have taken trash from the street and create some art out of it and that, you know, it rows and threads of it. And then all of a sudden you see kids at an altar, kids at a camp, kids at a convention or a story of a testimony before and after, or you see the, the, the duct tape cross, or you see trash art, things that were useless now become useful. Things that were unvaluable now become invaluable. Maybe you feel unvaluable, that you have no value. But if you come to the cross and go through the death pattern, that daily death pattern, what comes out on the other side is invaluable. You see, the whole idea behind trash art is that what we throw away, God redeems 
for good and creates his greatest masterpiece out of it. See, hear me. God is playing chess. And we are playing checkers. God has a better plan than the one that you are living. God has a better plan than the one that you are living. And it entails you coming to the cross, battle after battle after battle, so that you can finally win the war. Listen, I I want you to pray this. God, forgive me. Forgive me of my sin. I'm under conviction, but I don't want to just feel the guilt or the shame. Forgive me. I want to experience your salvation. Forgive me right now. God, take me to that death pattern, to that daily death on the cross. I want to be your finest work. I want to be your finest work. I believe in my heart. Come on, say it. I believe in my heart that you are Lord. I confess with my mouth that you are risen from the dead, that you are my Lord, risen from the dead. Take the old things away and bring new things into my life. I am yours and you are mine. God, thank you for forgiving me of my sin. I am not the same person as I was before the cross. I will be after that death pattern, after that daily death on the cross, I will live a forgiven and free life, able to do the things that I know I should do by the power of the cross.